And I think that's the nice part about retail relative to what you do is it's four walls and a roof and a parking lot, right? There's not multiple stories. There's not all this internal infrastructure for HVAC units. There's you know not elevators, there's not vertical stacks, right? It's four walls and a roof. Everyone inside a retail center is responsible for their own maintenance. They got it. If a toilet breaks, they got to fix it. Light fixtures go out, they got to fix it. So from a scaling standpoint and a management standpoint, it's pretty simple. It's not easy, but it's simple relative to multi. This is Country Club Conversations. I'm Raj Tut, founder and CEO of Storyboard Living. This show gives you actionable insights from the hard to reach top percentile in business and entrepreneurship. I think everyone deserves this type of access and I'm bringing it to you. Welcome to the club. Tom, thank you for being on the show. Oh, of course, Raj. Thanks for having me, man. You're the founder of Scout Capital Group, a company that you started in 2021 after spending close to a decade at Drury. Mm -hmm. uh, can you kind of touch on what Scout is at a high level and then also how you came about the idea of starting the company? Yeah, and thanks for having me. So Scout Capital is a sister company to a company called Scout Realty Group. And uh, I have three partners and they are the three owners of Scout Realty Group. It's Jared Hancock, Chris Zollner, Adam Glosher. And they are very high level retail brokers. They do a lot of tenant representation. They have clients such as Circle K or Texas Roadhouse, Arby's, Taco Bell, stuff like that, where they take Dutch Brothers Coffee. They take tenants around Missouri, Southern Illinois, Kansas, you know, kind of Midwest and find sites for them. When I was at Drury, Drury Ho uh, Development Corporation, which is uh, basically the landlord for Drury Hotels, and uh, I was there, great experience doing basically everything that was not a hotel. We had restaurant ground leases, we had retail shopping centers, we had office buildings, we had cell towers, we had billboards, we had vacant land. And uh, so during COVID, when the hotel business obviously took a hit, because people weren't staying in hotels during March of 2020, you know, we had to figure out how to raise capital from the assets that the Drury family had to fund hotel operations. And part of that was dispersing of some of the assets that I was working on. We had a bunch of like Olive Garden ground leases that we could sell. We had an office building we could sell. We had the corporate office building that we owned free and clear. So we had to come up with some creative ways to raise capital. And one of those ways was I hired my partner, my current partner, Adam Glosier, to be kind of my master broker and to dispose of some of these assets, help me sell land in Arizona, help me sell land in Colorado and sell some ground leases. And we did a really good job and we had a great relationship um, and working with them. And when the idea came to, uh, and we can dive into that, the idea came for Scout Capital you know, I, I approached Adam with it and said, hey, here's here's what I want to do. Uh, I've got this this idea and we can go and take your guys's deal flow that you guys uncover as these great brokers. And let's go um, raise private capital to go buy some real estate. And when I when I walked into Adam's office, he thought I was firing him as my broker, as my master broker. But it uh, turned out that it was kind of the start of a, a partnership, which was pretty cool. That's an interesting story. So I knew you were with Drury, but I didn't know that you were doing everything that wasn't hotels. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I just thought you were running their, uh, maybe their, uh, you know, development arm for their hotel construction. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the responsibilities you had there in terms of the areas that just started and ended with you? Sure. Well, the family is, it's an all family owned company. So they have uh, 150 hotels and all family owned. And part of that was out of developing hotels, you get extra stuff, you get extra land, you buy a little bit bigger of a parcel than you need for a hotel. And what they did a long time ago, which is really smart is, is they used to be in the restaurant business, you know, it used to be, you have a restaurant in the first floor of a hotel, and it's kind of like a full service, you get room service, all that stuff. And they dove into the limited service segment where they took that full service restaurant out of their four walls and then add that 
in the parking lot. You picture out here, like the Bob Evans, you know, that's an older jury product, but Bob Evans was a big user in front of juries for a long time, uh, certainly in the 80s. So they got out of the restaurant business. And so you get, you kind of focus on what you do best, which is operating limited service hotels and getting those amenities outside the hotel and into the ground lease. You kind of take that risk off of your company's plate. And my job was to take new developments and find those users outside the hotels. So like Bonefish Grill in Brentwood, as an example, we did uh, a Firebirds in Carmel, Indiana. So I, I, I had like the whole country, everywhere we had a jury, my job was kind of that out parcel stuff. But they also owned office buildings as kind of time goes on, you buy an office building for your own use and, or maybe it's a good investment next to a hotel. They also had retail shopping centers that they developed in Cape Girardeau. We also developed one in Nashville, Tennessee. So yeah, my job was to kind of manage that. I mean, I was like the only person in the whole company that didn't touch a hotel. I was like the black sheep that was that, what does Tom do again? Tom's in retail? Like, (laughs) we don't, what is that? You know, we're all hotel people. And so I, it was a really fun place to be. And I, I, I learned a lot and it was basically reported directly to Tim Drury. My boss is one of the family members, uh, president of the company. And my job was just to keep the cash flow coming in, keep making sure that tenants were paying on time, that uh, you know, we had a lot of mom and pop tenants, especially in the strip centers. And, uh, you know, it was just a great experience in learning how to think like an owner and think generationally about how do we preserve the value of this asset? How do we keep tenants continuing to pay rent? You know, learning about you know, how vacancy kills the cash flow of a center and tenant improvement allowances and how you need to think about amortizing that kind of stuff and negotiating with brokers. And so I just had a huge stable of, I don't know, probably 250, 300 tenants that I was responsible for, you know, renegotiating with and working things out, especially if you had like a mom and pop where uh, we didn't make our, our rent payment this month, uh, dog ate my homework kind of stuff, you know, um, I'm sure you, I'm sure you deal with that on the apartment side. And so you have to empathize with people a little bit and figure out how to, you don't want to just take the hard line of like, you, you're in default, we're kicking you out. Let's work out, let's work this out. Or what's going on in your life? Like, how do we move this forward such that you get to stay in here and operate the business that's feeding your family. But, you know, I got a job to do. I got to put money in the company bank so we can go build more hotels. So it's kind of that balance and learning how to deal with people that way. Your retail focus makes so much more sense to me now. <laughs> I should have asked you. Yeah. I, I don't know why I never did, but I just assumed you were working in hospitality one way or another. Uh, so that retail experience. I know barely anything about hotels. <laughs> the retail experience you had with Drury, along with um, just your maybe your prior experience as well, was kind of what led to Scout. But was there a single catalyst that maybe made you make the jump at a, a time when really the world was uncertain. 2021 wasn't the easiest time to jump into right. entrepreneurship. That infamous meeting with Adam where he thought I was going to fire him. The prelude to that was, you know, I'm sitting in my basement in March of 2020 and we're getting all these tenants calling us. We need rent breaks. You know, you get the shoe carnival calling, you get Panera Bread calling, you get Starbucks calling, you get Party City calling. They all want a rent break. And, you know, we didn't know what to do either, right? This is uncharted territory. It's a global pandemic. And we just went from, you know, whatever, 70%, 75% hotel occupancy down to 10 overnight. And we we're trying to figure it out on the fly. How do you work through this? And it was a great learning experience. And again, the blocking and tackling of, workouts and you get some tenants that are going bankrupt and you get some tenants that are maybe full of it, you know, like a Starbucks with their drive-thru was, was doing fine. Like they didn't need a rent break and we, we could sniff that out. But where I'm going with that is, you know, it's a stressful time. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out how to raise this money. I'm hiring Adam to do uh, the brokerage for us and, you know, I'm cutting my grass, listening to podcasts, you know, like this one. And the one that I really latched onto was the Ford podcast and not to advertise someone else's podcast on your podcast, but, um, you know, Chris Powers is someone I discovered through real estate Twitter and that's how we met. Right. And his podcast, he gave a lot lot of information about how he built his company and how they thought about the world and how they raised capital. 
And one of the things that they did really well and still do is real estate syndication. You know, you asked me in 2019, what's a real estate syndication? I didn't know, right? I had to learn it in 2020, listening to podcasts and getting smart about it. And that model just made so much sense to me of the Ford or uh, Ford Capital, Chris's company. They are the experts in their market segment. They are class B industrial people and people invest with them and they use their money, pay a return and they collect a fee and they get a split of the profits. And like that all just made a ton of sense to me. So I took that idea and presented it to, to my boss, to Tim Drury. I was like, this is actually a great way to raise capital. And we had our corporate office building and we syndicated out the equity. We raised some capital, we put some debt on it. They owned it free and clear. And that was one of the big, probably the bigger deals we had in putting capital back into the company to keep operations going was that syndication. And I just got the bug. Like I loved talking to the investors. I loved, you know, figuring out the waterfall. I loved talking with the attorneys on, you know, what the structure is and, and, you know, this 40 page PPM that we had to put together. And I just had to do it. I had to try and do this myself. I just fell in love with the model and eventually brought it to Adam. I was like, can this, is this something you guys want to do? And he talked about it with Chris and Jared for about a day. And they called me back the next day and said, quit your job. We need to start this. And that was Labor Day of 2021. So it's been just over two years. That's an incredible story. I, th- I feel like a lot of people, when they talk about that side of real estate, real estate structuring deals, um, they're either learning through an MBA or some sort of formal education, or maybe through personal and family connections. So for you to to start with Twitter, a platform that it I sounds think silly, doesn't it? Most people don't associate Twitter with education, but real estate Twitter is very educational, very much. And and you know, it is the onus is on the user to craft their own feed in order to be educational. Mm-hmm. So that's a great story. I didn't want to assume that you didn't have personal or family connections in real estate. Can you give some background on maybe how you grew up, where you grew up? Sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a St. Louis, and I grew up in St. Louis, and uh, my parents were both working parents. My mom was a, was a teacher and, uh, you know, probably most of my hard work and resilience and, and, you know, competitiveness comes from her. She was a really good, is a really good athlete and drive me all the soccer practices and all that kind of stuff. My, my dad worked a lot. He worked for the family business, which was started by my grandpa uh, right after World War II. It was a plumbing supply business, still exists today. My uncle owns it. It's called Milford Plumbing Supply. And, uh. Yeah, I mean, my dad was always trying to drive his business forward. He was president for 25, 30 years, uh, left to start his own cabinet company. Well, first he created a cabinet company inside Milford, took that out and and sold to his family and said, I want to do this on my own. Did great with it. And he, as part of that cabinet company, was doing a lot of work for a general contractor. And him and his general contractor friend decided to start another independent general contracting company because my dad always wanted to move up the food chain is something I I can just remember him saying that to me probably in high school. Right. I I just, you know, being the plumbing supplies, you rely on the plumber and the plumber relies on the contractor and the contractor relies on the owner or the developer and the developer might rely on an owner or, or something like that. So that image of reliance on where you are in the food chain really stuck with me, I think has driven me probably to this day of aspiring to be at the next higher level. And that's why I started as a general contractor out of college, working for a a company that did general contracting and development. And then I parlayed that into a development job and then was a broker after the great financial crisis and then landed at Drury and and now at Scout. So it, it really was, I think, my dad's entrepreneurial spirit of, you know, kind of aim higher, you know, that don't be a, there's nothing wrong with being a, in plumbing supplies. It just wasn't something that he felt a passion about. He wanted to be more in the driver's seat. And to me that, I feel like that is a, a voice in the back of my head of, at all times, if that makes any sense. It does. It, it truly does. Cause I feel like now you're at the top of the food chain, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm at the bottom for sure. Uh, so I would say banks are at the top of the food chain, but we'll get into this in a bit. You guys aren't looking to borrow 
much debt from banks for your deals anyways, correct? That is the thesis, yes. So yes. then you're at the top of the food chain. You made your dad proud. <laughs> my dad is proud of me, and I, I owe a lot to both my parents for, I mean, you know, I, I believe in this strongly that I, I just am the luckiest person. You know, I've been blessed with, with a great family that gave me a great opportunity. And, you know, I try to, entrepreneurs definitely make, make it on their own for the most part, but they're standing on the shoulders of everyone that came before them, right? And the the opportunities, the education I got, you know, it's definitely been a game changer for sure. I would agree with that. Uh, your mom, you said, was an incredible athlete. Yeah. So you didn't get into what sports or sports she played or coached? Yeah, she. my, my mom uh, played field hockey and coached field hockey. She was a state champion, high school field hockey coach at Visitation some, sometime in the 90s. And she coached us when we were kids. She also was a very, is a very good golfer, club champion a few times. And, and so that just, I don't know about you, Roger, like how you're, you grew up, but like with me, when, you're, when your dad's working a lot, you just get so much from your mom about how to behave and how to stand in line and wait your turn. And you get these osmosis experiences from her of just, this is how I compete. This is how I, I carry myself. This is how I talk to people. And, you know, so I, I feel like I got a great, well-rounded influence from both of them. And I think they both have contributed to who I am as a, as a man, but also as an entrepreneur. You kind of get that competitive drive from one side, and then you get that kind of ambition from my dad. And it's kind of, you kind of get a, a better picture of, of, how I think or who I am, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's a great combination. I, I would agree. I uh, grew up similarly uh, with one exception. I grew up in a multi-generational home. So my grandparents lived with us as well. Okay. And I definitely got a lot from them. Uh, interesting uh, point or interesting fact that your mom might uh, like uh, my grandmother's brother played field hockey. Really? And he won an Olympic medal in 1968 in Mexico. For field hockey. Okay. And then uh, some other, I think like the Asian games or like a few other major tournaments as well. So <laughs> your mom might find that interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> there was a Olympic festival here in St. Louis. I forget what Olympic festival was. It was like, it was before the 96 games. I think it was in 94. And my sister was a f 94. She was have been nine years old and was like a little ball girl on the sidelines. And it was a men's field hockey game. And one of the American players didn't like a foul that got called on him. He whipped the ball straight to the sideline, hit my sister right in the face. Oh, man. <laughs> and, like, broke an orbital bone, all this stuff. And then, like, obviously the man felt terrible. And there's all these pictures of the entire U.S. men's field hockey team coming into the hospital and taking pictures with my sister. And there's all these signed banners and stuff. And it was like, I don't know, I thought that was like, you know, athletes don't have to do that kind of stuff, but it's – it's just kind of a funny family story of how like my poor nine-year-old sister getting whacked with I mean, those field hockey balls are hard. She's good now, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Everything's fine. But so then was, we can laugh about it. Yeah, we can totally <laughs> laugh about it. Uh, but it's yeah, it's just a interesting tidbit. Yeah, no, that's uh very cool that the team did that. I think that's that's yeah. awesome on their part. Sure. So um moving away from the field hockey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> field hockey time is over. Yeah. <laughs> Scout Capital, you started again in 21 from scratch, from zero. And within two years, you launched a fund. Yes. Uh, can you kind of share what that fund is about, what the thesis is, and maybe what you're, you're targeting? Yeah. So the initial vision was kind of like what I was talking about with uh, the Drury office building. Like, let's syndicate out. Let's do 20% equity, 80%, like the traditional private equity model. You know, use this you know, basically zero percent interest rates to acquire some real estate, and, and we had some success with that. We closed a couple deals, and then we had a, a property under contract in 2022. It was a retail center, and we were, I think, we put it on a contract in June, and we got a rate lock from a from a bank, uh, a local lender here, and the rate was, I'm gonna forget, but it was like four and a quarter, which is like. <laughs> Like singing here in, you know, November of 23, like four and a quarter. Remember that? Yeah. And so as time went on and we were going through due diligence, you know, there were some environmental issues with the property that were not a huge deal, but we had to clean it up in order for the lender to close. And so it keeps getting pushed out. It's June. It's it's July. It's 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 September and August, September. And then 
the bank saying, we can't extend this rate lock anymore. Rates are climbing since they, the Fed started messing around in June. And we eventually had to terminate because we could not get the environmental cleaned up fast enough and we lost our rate. And then the deal didn't make sense anymore because when you're buying in a seven cap retail deal with you know 4% debt, that's fine. But if you're buying a 7% cap deal with five and a half or six, you know, you're upside down on leverage because I'm, I'm sure most people listening to this know you're paying principal and interest. So it's not just the interest rate. You got to play the principal too. And now you have negative cash flow. So essentially putting debt at that rate creates a negative cash flow. We call that negative leverage. So we were licking our wounds from that, trying to figure out what to do. And, you know, like in February, we came to the idea of what if we pooled capital at a larger scale so that we can just take banks out of it? Let's, because ultimately, if you buy deals that are in the mid eight caps, you know, I, I, was, I mean, are we talking, sorry, this is a, a tangent, Raj, but are you assuming most of your audience understands what a cap rate is or should we kind of define it? You know what? That's a great question. One that I've never really thought about. I think, um, it doesn't hurt to do a quick <laughs> definition. Okay. Really, it'll just help to kind of show your expertise as well. But, sure. Uh, yeah, just a quick definition. Yeah. So I mean, a cap rate, for those who don't know, is essentially the net income, net operating income divided by the purchase price. And so if cap rates are low, that means you're paying more for the same amount of net income. And so what we're seeing in all asset classes is a cap rate rise and that you have to pay less for the same amount of income because generally incomes are not changing drastically. Maybe in, an, in multifamily incomes are, you're seeing rent decrease. But in my world where you have five-year leases plus incomes don't change that drastically year over year in, in the way an apartment might. Is, is that I agree with the overall point. Um, in the Metro East, we're, seeing, we're still seeing rent growth there was actually a report that came out, I want to say maybe two weeks ago now, where the Metro East, and this doesn't happen often, is leading the St. Louis region in rent growth. Okay. Uh, so we're still seeing increasing revenues, but I, I totally understand the point. You know, you're you're locking in your income for three, four or five years, seven years sometimes. Right. Um, and we're not, we're, we're trading it out every year. Yes. Yeah. Which is the big difference between the asset classes you and I play in. So... The overall point I was trying to make was uh, cap rates are rising, but not at the rate that interest rates are rising. And so you get this flip where it's inverted, where you used to be able to add debt and you would get a spread between your cap rate and your debt constant, which is essentially the principal and interest divided by the loan balance. And that spread was there and has been there for a decade. And now that's flipped where you have negative leverage and cap rates are, are still climbing and they're still probably historically very attractive. I've been in this business adjacently, at least since I graduated college in 05 or 04. And mid eight cap, nine cap for multi-tenant retail is historically solid. Pre-financial crisis, all the way through post-financial crisis, that's a good return, generally. You're not gonna be seeing 10% returns on investment for a long period of time. You might find some unicorns where you can really see that that increase. But generally I found across my career is eight and a half percent return cash on cash is healthy. And is that uh, just to interject real quick, is that for like a class B 10,000 square foot strip center? Is that kind of what you're envisioning when you say that? Yes. Good point. Because I think ultimately in your business, you can't even find eight and a half percent cash on cash because the competition's there. I, I Yeah. I think that and I'm not an economist or any, you know, uh, anyone like that, that that could speak that high level. Just in my limited personal experience in talking to investors, getting an eight plus percent return on your cash is historically beats the S&P, beats most other type of investment vehicles. And in an alternative asset class, that is solid. And so our thesis is with the fund, if you can accumulate these assets in the good locations with strong traffic drivers that are going to hold long-term value. You know, they're not somewhere out in a far flung rural place that is maybe a little speculative, but if it's a proven area 
even if it's class B, you're going to have a long-term value. You you can count on that eight plus percent return, and potentially, if you have the right team in place, you can grow that and compound and turn that eight into a ten, hopefully over time. And so, if you can't do it with debt. Let's try and pool equity to take the banks out of it. Let's acquire these shopping centers with 100% equity. And then in the future, I think everyone is presuming that there's going to be a pullback, that the Fed's eventually going to have to pull back and lower the interest rates so that the economy can breathe again. And at that point, maybe it's two years down the line, maybe it's five years down the line. But at that point, then you can do a big recapitalization. You can give all the investors basically their initial capital back, but now you have a 60, 65% leveraged portfolio that's cash flowing at a, you know, hopefully a 10 uh, return on cost. And then you get that positive leverage and now you're getting 12 on your remaining equity. And now we're cooking with gas. Like that is the big picture idea. And we came up with that in February. We spent a bunch of money on lawyers and website and, and uh, logos and all that stuff and launched in May. Uh, we spent most of the summer trying to find deals. You know, it, it's finding deals in a haystack because sellers are not willing to, you know, they were like, well, I, I should get a seven cap for this. You know, the broker told me in June of 2020 that this was a seven cap. So I want a seven cap. I was like, well, that's, that's not the market today. And so getting that bid ask spread down to a point where you can transact has been the hard part. But we're starting to see some deal flow. And so the, now the, the crunch is, can we pool enough assets, enough capital to kind of execute on the vision for it? So if I understand correctly, your first fund, which, correct me if I'm wrong here, you're raising or looking to raise $50 million. Correct. And that fund is going to be used to buy retail strip centers across the Midwest. Yes. In what you said is a good location. Yes. So when you say good location, can you expand on that a little bit? Like sure. what markets are you looking at? What sub markets or what um, demographics do you prefer? Yeah. So, and then this is good location is beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? But for us, for the fund target, we want to be in mature neighborhoods and major metros. And we want to be in the B and C centers, those centers that are very service oriented, that have either grocery or have fitness or hair salons, nail salons, you know, restaurants, those things that are kind of meet the daily needs of the population of our country. You know, we're not going after soft good retailers. We're not doing Burlington Coat Factories or Ross Dress for Lesses. We think that there's still an e-commerce challenge with those types of centers. And uh, they're usually a lot bigger boxes, meaning they're bigger, deeper bay depths, a lot wider, they're, they're harder to retenant. You know, it's a much harder to retenant a 40,000 square foot Burlington Co. factory than it is a 2,000 square foot nail salon. And so we see a lot of stickiness to the, to the tenants in these class B shopping centers where they are, they are providing those daily needs. They're run by the people that work there, or that, sorry, they're owned by the people that work there. They're feeding their families out of these businesses. You know, as I found, as we talked about in my jury experience, like when you get to a COVID and you get to a financial crisis, these are the people who are going to do everything they can to pay the rent because they cannot lose that income for their family. And so we just see a lot of positive trends around kind of the strip mall or the neighborhood shopping center. And so the other thing, the other piece of that is new construction is from but like you know exaggerating here maybe but all time low for new development like you are not seeing brand new shopping centers going up there's a few like in our market there's the Costco deal at at 170 in in, in Olive but that's a rare exception like that was a big tenant that needed a space that had a hole you're not seeing people build spec retail these days it's too expensive the entitlements take forever tenants can't afford the rent cuz construction costs are so high interest rates are contributing to that too so you're seeing like a lot of retail demand. There's a lot of strong fundamentals around, you know, tenants are expanding. You're seeing, who is it that just announced? Starbucks is adding another 17,000 locations. They want to- Where? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? But they see the demand. Um, Dutch Brothers is touring here. Circle K is looking for new gas stations. You're seeing five below open new stores. 
So there's just a huge demand and there's no vacancy. We're at historic lows vacancy in the U.S. as long as they've been tracking it for retail. And so you kind of get in this perfect storm of high demand, low construction, and where are they going to go? They're going to go to these where all the people live. You're going to go to these mature neighborhoods where the traffic patterns are already established, where the lights are already in place, where you have density of population and for us, we want to find those ugliest center on the block, but it's in a good location. It's at a corner, it's at a light. And we know that the tenant base is going to be there. And we know that we're going to have the right tenant mix to weather e-commerce, great financial crisis, COVID. These are the tenants, they're like the cockroaches of, of our industry. They, they've survived and they figured out how to live in e-commerce. They figured out how to deal with COVID with you know, curbside and all that kind of stuff. So we just see a lot of really strong fundamentals driving this industry. And we also see the dislocation because of the interest rate environment. What I'm trying to say is people traditionally need debt. They do not know how to buy deals without debt. On the whole, people are so accustomed to using debt, they don't understand how to buy something all cash. Like, what does that even look like? And to the competition that we're buying against, they always use debt and they, they, they don't have a model where they could take that out of the picture. So they're just waiting. They're waiting for interest rates to come down and they're sitting on their capital. And so there's this really narrow window of time where we can come in and buy things at a discount where everyone's waiting for interest rates to come down because we're going to add debt later. And so that's the big picture thesis behind our fund. I think a seller would be very inclined to go with an all cash offer. You remove the debt risk out of, you know, that that LOI. Uh, that's a huge piece, mm -hmm. uh, a huge advantage for you. So uh, just so I can get a better understanding of how you're thinking about the deals you're doing or going to do. Let's say if you found a deal in, let's just call it Kirkwood. Mm -hmm. Hypothetical center, it's 20,000 square feet there. It's 60% occupied. Uh, tenants include a pizza place, a barber, a nail salon. What would you be looking for in terms of when you're looking at the property, the type of seller? Maybe you mentioned traffic count, age of the center. Like, What are you looking at before you even submit an offer? And then once you submit that offer, how are you performing DD? The way I, I would answer that is the sellers in this space are typically, and even if you take the, the current interest rate environment off, off the table for a second, most of these centers are owned by mom and pop sellers. These are not professional REITs or big owners that we are buying from. These are uh, have owned it in the family for 30, 40 years. This is grandpa's center and grandpa is either passed away or wants to cash out and the next generation doesn't want it. And so we're just seeing, there's a, just that you, you hear people talk about silver tsunami that is happening in retail real estate, that people are looking for wealth, estate planning purposes on, on how to transfer this wealth to the next generation. And so, and the other piece of that is they are not professional landlords. They have not been driving rents forward. They have not been watching expenses. They have not been reinvesting in, the roof and the facade and the signage, you know, it's kind of been, Hey, it works now. Let's just keep the rent the way it is. You know, we bought a center in 2021 that had a Chinese restaurant in it. And that Chinese restaurant has not had a rent increase since 1985 when it was built. So that is a very typical seller for us. And so now you have, add the interest rate environment back in, you're going to have a, another crop of sellers that are running into, hey, I got to refinance this debt. And now I'm in distress. And so now not only do you have all the sellers that were already going to be there because of generational wealth transfer, but now you have distress in the market. So if, there's a lot of sellers, but all of them, typically the ones we find are not professional companies. And so when we approach them, it's really, usually typically it's a broker-led transaction. Brokers, I think, are the best source of deals. There's only one of me and my three partners, but we can leverage every other broker in the markets. We talk to them, we tell them what we're looking for. They're the ones out there cold calling, 
finding the deals. So we get a lot of deals brought to us through brokers and they all kind of fit one of those two buckets, either the distress bucket or the, you know, baby boomer aging out bucket. And to answer your question about how we proceed, you know, it's pretty simple. And I think that's the nice part about retail relative to what you do is it's four walls and a roof and a parking lot, right? There's not multiple stories. There's not all this internal infrastructure for HVAC units. There's, you know, not elevators, there's not vertical stacks, right? It's four walls and a roof. Everyone inside a retail center is responsible for their own maintenance. They got it. If a toilet breaks, they got to fix it. Light fixtures go out, they got to fix it. So from a scaling standpoint and a management standpoint, it's pretty simple. It's not easy, but it's simple relative to multi. And so really we're just looking for, is it structurally sound? Is there any environmental condition issues we need to worry about? You know, do we need to do some soil borings? Let's get a phase one. If we need to, let's get a phase two. And then you, it's all about ticking down the box of how old's the roof? All right, let's budget for how much that roof's going to cost to replace. All right, how's the parking lot look? Do we need to do a, a mill and overlay, right? Do we camera the sewer? Is the sewer collapsed or not? Is it in good condition? Is it going to last? Like, you know, just kind of typical physical due diligence stuff. But really, we're, we're underwriting the location more than anything. Is this a growing submarket? Is this have good household incomes? Is there daytime population that can support restaurants? What are the traffic counts? You know, is it is it 5,000 cars a day or is it 25,000 cars a day? And that matters. And, you know, because the interesting thing in, in this, I'm quoting my partner, Adam, retail is like a puzzle because there is a certain tenant mix that works. If you buy a center with, you said 60% occupied, there's, you said 20,000 feet, 40% vacant, you got 8,000 square feet vacant. There's only so many tenants that could take 8,000. We know what tenants they are. And my partners are better at this than I. So maybe you should have Adam or Chris or Jared on this to talk about this piece. But, you know, there's a certain amount of tenants that can fit that. And you look around the centers, is five below already in the market? Is five guys burgers and fries already in the market? They only take probably 3,000 feet, but maybe it's subdividable, right? And so it's really, users like to go in flocks and they all like to be around each other in the same type of center. And you can solve that puzzle by looking at other centers and saying, well, this one doesn't have a hair salon. Let's go find one. This one doesn't have a Chinese restaurant. Let's go find one. This one doesn't have a grocery store. Let's go find it. So it's, it's not rocket science. It's, it's simple, but it's hard. You have to know the right people. You have to know who to call to get the grocery center in there, grocery store in there. You have to know the guy at five guys, burgers and fries to get him to look at your deal. So there's a, there's a relationship piece to it. There's a problem solving piece to it. But a lot of it's just instinct and, and gut feeling on, all right, is this a good location? Or does it feel nice? Is it easy to access? Is the signage good? Where someone's driving by, wants a burger, they see the sign and they can pull in. Those are the kind of factors that we're, we're looking for. When you mentioned that you're mainly buying from mom and pops, mm-hmm. if everything's the same, building, numbers, location, all that, if that deal's owned by a mom and pop, do you look at it differently versus if it was owned by the mom and pop, but they had a third party, very professional management company in place that's leasing it? Like, for example, if it's me and I'm looking at it, I think that 40% of vacancy can maybe be leased up if we come in. But if they already had a professional company running it and it's still vacant, I may start to look at the deal a little differently. Does that change the equation for you? That's a good question. I would say it depends on who the operator is and who the broker is that's leasing it. Brokers are human beings, right? If there's a 8,000 square foot vacancy in this center, but it's all chopped up into one little 1,000 square foot spaces and it's a junior broker working it, or it's at the opposite spectrum, it's the best broker in town, but he likes to get paid on 50,000 square foot leases, not 1,000 square foot leases. So it's what are the incentives around that broker to lease that space? I assume if it's a professional property management company, the expenses are probably pretty in line and there's not a lot of opportunity there. But I think the owner matters more than the operator when it comes to driving leases because they're the ones who have to sign the lease. They're the ones who have to agree to the tenant allowance package. 
There's a center that we're chasing right now where my partner, Jared, is bringing a tenant to the center. And this is a big center. This is 100,000 square feet, 40% vacant, great location. They don't have the money to put into TI. So the, the tenant needs to come in, build out their own space, put in their own HVAC because the seller is not watching the expenses. They're not planning for the future. They don't know how to draw a line of credit from a bank to fund these things. And so they're not doing deals. They can't do deals. So we're coming in with an offer where they get paid and they come out, but we think there's a ton of upside because historically this seller, all the brokers know, don't bring them a deal because they can't do it. Your tenant's going to have to come out the nose to fund all these improvements. So there's just little opportunities like that all across the country where people, especially these mom and pops, just don't know how to professionally manage these things. They don't know how to watch the expenses. They don't know how to go get a line of credit. They don't know how to negotiate these things such that you don't get stuck with a half vacant building and no money to, to put tenants back into it. So there's value in that without a doubt. And I, I've seen that myself as well, even though I'm not in retail, just with leasing some of our own properties. So there, is there another way you're adding value through restructuring leases as well? Like, for example, you mentioned toilets before, where tenants are typically repairing the things within their four walls. But I've seen some retail properties where mom and pop landlords don't have triple net type of structure or even any sort of structure around repairs where they're still handling repairs as if it were an apartment. Do you see stuff like that? Are you able to go in and add value through uh, redoing leases and things like that? Totally, totally. Um, we just did one at, at this center that we bought last year where all the tenants were on gross leases. And gross leases means that they just pay a rent number and the landlord takes care of all the other expenses. And in retail, it's typically triple net, but for these mom and pops, Gross is, is easier. It's easier to calculate. It's just one number. We want to convert all these leases to triple nets. And what that means is the tenants still probably pay one number, but in there is a separate line item for common area maintenance, a separate line item for insurance, a separate line item for real estate taxes. And those numbers are subject to change based on if they go up or down. And so the risk of... Uh, a heavy snow one year where snow removal spikes or insurance level spike, or there's a big real estate tax reassessment and that spikes, that risk is passed on to the tenants. And that is probably the number one thing mom and pop retail operators do not take into account is that they are on the hook because their tenants get in one number. If you put them on a triple net lease, you can pass all those expenses back on to the tenants. And I think that is the biggest opportunity we see in the class B and C when it comes to your question about, is there things in the leases where you can add a lot of value? And I think there's a lot of value to be added there. Have you seen, or do you think you'll see deals where some of the mom and pops weren't converting to triple net leases? So they're not able to recoup their increased insurance and tax expenses, which, you know, as you know, are two major issues in the real estate world in general right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a big deal. I mean, they, I don't know why they don't think about it, right? It's, it seems obvious to me, but maybe that's kind of goes back to this asset class is they do not have that experience. They do not have that insight to say, well, this is actually market. If you go to Subway and lease the Subway, they're going to expect a triple net lease. If you hand them a gross lease, they're going to say, okay, great. We'll just take that. You know, So being able to push back and know what market is and know what market rents are is a big leg up that we have in this space relative to the typical owner seller. You mentioned earlier as well that there's not a lot of new retail development at this moment. Is there a range that you look to pay per square foot to ensure that your product is protected against new supply? Yes. General rule of thumb is we like to be in and around 100 bucks a foot. New construction, if you take land out of it, is probably around 250. And so for someone to come in, they got to buy a piece of dirt and put 250 bucks a foot on top of it. And in the markets we're buying, you know, there's not a lot of available dirt. So one of the centers we have under contract right now that we're trying to close by the end of the year is in a historic neighborhood. There's a lot of moats around this property. You would have to tear down a bunch of old brick homes in St. Louis to build enough where you can compete and take away our grocery store or our fitness center or our subway. 
And we like that. We like that there is a high barrier to entry, both on just the brain damage to go through acquisition and assemblage, but then you got to get through zoning. You got to get the neighborhood to agree to a, a retail center when most municipalities want to see mixed use. They want to see high density. And so we like having that that's already entitled, already zoned for a strip center with a big parking lot in front where it's easy to park and easy to get your groceries in a mature neighborhood because we know that it's going to be impossible to replicate that at any level that's going to be a threat to us. Yeah, someone could come in and build a, a high rise, right, and put retail on the ground floor, but the retail is going to be a a restaurant and it's, it might be a nail salon, but you're not going to replace a big 20,000 square foot grocery store. It's just the odds of it are so minuscule, it's almost not worth talking about, if that makes sense. Is there a bank there as well? There is a bank. Okay. I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, We're so, looking for equity, Rob. <laughs> I 100% agree you can't replace it. Right. Uh, there, there's no room. There's no room. I think some of the grocery competition is shutting down or having some issues. In St. Louis specifically, yeah. yeah. If we're talking about yeah. just St. Louis, there is a grocery concept that likes to be in urban locations that is having some issues, correct? Yeah, yeah. which might drive sales to your center, potentially. Correct. correct. So you look at a deal, you like the deal, you like the market, you think it's going to be a good fit for your company, you close on the deal, like the one we're talking about. How do you manage it? Are you handling property management in-house, leasing in-house, of course? So we... We're trying to stay as lean as possible. So there, right now, it's just the four of us. We have no staff. We like it that way for a number of reasons, most of which is there's a lot of headaches that come with managing people and payroll and HR and all that kind of stuff. And, and what we're good at is finding deals and asset managing them. And asset management is my role, what I did at Drury, which was negotiate these renewals keep the, the cash flow coming in, manage the budget, manage the property managers. You know, I, I manage a Drury probably close to a million square feet with just me and a property manager, you know, because of the nature of, of these deals. It's it's not as hands-on as a multifamily deal where you're, you don't have people living there. And so our vision is to outsource property management, outsource legal, outsource accounting, so we can do what we do best and let people who love property management, who are experts in it, do that. And we pay them to do it. In the future, might we bring property management in-house? If we find a someone who wants to do that for us, I, I think I'd be a terrible property manager. I, I'm really good at asset management. And my partners are really good at making rain and finding deals. I don't want any of them being property managers or pretending to be one. They'd be bad at it. So I'm just really a big believer in specialization and doing what you're meant to be doing and doing what you're good at. And you know, if, if you came over and wanted to be a retail broker, you'd probably be terrible at it because Raj Dutt was not meant to be a retail broker. You were meant to be the owner of Storyboard Living. So it's, uh, you may leave some money on the table or we might leave some money on the table not having property management in-house or accounting in-house, but we think it's going to end up being a better result for our investors if if we do let the, the professionals do what they do best. That lean approach will probably help cycle in and out of deals quicker as well, or a lot easier. You don't have to restructure your property management company if there was one. So do you have a hold period that you're targeting with the fund in terms of each individual deal or the fund in general? So the fund is designed to be a closed end fund. And what that means is it's not the, the opposite of a closed end fund is a rolling fund where you have one fund that owns everything and you sell in and out of it. A closed end fund is you raise for a certain period of time you invest for a certain period of time and then you close it. And then those are the only assets in that fund. And so our vision is to do a closed end fund, this first one that has this specific vision to, or specific strategy to acquire with only cash and recap later when rates are accretive to the value of the deal. Fund two might be different than that, or it might be the same strategy, but the idea would be let's do multiple funds over time and the whole period for each fund will probably be eight to 12 years until we kind of come full cycle on the vision. You, you, you spend the first three years increasing value, increasing NOI through operations and leasing. And then in years two, three, four, you will find that attractive capital probably on a five or seven year balloon. And when that five or seven year balloon kind of rolls, hopefully you're in a, another bull run and you kind of sell at a compressed cap rate. Hopefully we're on fund three or four at that time. 
and maybe we roll everything up to a larger fish, uh, a REIT or a pension fund that wants to acquire all the things that we've assembled. Uh, we did all the dirty work for them and we you know, professionalized all the property management and the reporting and we've got all the leases on a standard form and everyone's on triple net cams. And um, we think that's going to be attractive though to a buyer and call it eight to 12 years. Are you buying just the strip center type of product we talked about or are you, are you also looking at like single tenant retail some other forms of retail. I know you're not looking at big box. Right. So our the main thrust of our business is acquiring Class B shopping centers and doing them in the fun vehicle, just like the Drury family did when they were building hotels. You run into other things. And they got into the restaurant business. They got in the billboard business. They got all these things. We're not trying to do that. But one thing we are willing to do is develop for our clients. You know, I mentioned at the top, my partners represent Circle K, as an example. We have a site under control in St. Charles to build a Circle K development with three other retail paths. One of our clients is BJC Healthcare. We just completed a outpatient clinic for them in Godfrey, just north of here, 20,000 square feet for bringing all those outpatient services out of the hospital. So that was uh, client driven. They, they liked us, they liked the way we do business. We could deliver for them. We did deliver for them. They're open and operating. What I'm trying to say, Raj, is like those will come driven by the client. When the client wants us to develop something, we'll do it. We're not going to go tie up a bunch of sites and try to pigeonhole into a client. It's going to be client driven. And if our clients don't have a need, we are absolutely 100% committed and focused to the class B neighborhood thesis. But as tenants lead us the horse to water and say, you guys are great. We want you to build another one of these. We can scale up and do that. I'm curious then how the BJC deal came to fruition because they are, I think they're the largest hospital system in Missouri. And I think they're the largest employer in St. Louis. They are. So how did that come to fruition? Because you said it's it's kind of client driven. Mm -hmm. You did it because they wanted it to be built. So how did that deal get presented to you? And how did you decide to work with them on this? So my partner, Jared, represents BJC, and BJC had a need. They have a need for an outpatient clinic. Alton Memorial Hospital is the main you know, hospital uh, location for them in that area. And it gets expensive when you have someone coming in for a routine physical, or you have a, a pediatric clinic in there and, and kids need to get checked up. It's so much easier in a retail setting. It's so much easier in a one-story building where the parking's in front, like everything we've been talking about. It's good access, uh, good visibility on a major thoroughfare. And so, like you see urgent cares popping up around town. It's, it's that same model where you go where the people are. And they identified that as a need for them and had Jared go in looking for sites. And ultimately, you probably need to have Jared on to talk about how it, it, it transitioned, but ultimately we were asked to, if we could develop it for them. And of course we jumped at the opportunity. You know, it, 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 Jared has been doing their work for years. He does a tremendous job for them. He's found them a ton of sites. And this one, there, it was just the right fit where they had a need for a developer and we could, we could fill that need for them because we have the development experience. I've developed for Drury, I developed for Opus. My partner, Chris has developed CVSs and Starbucks. And so we have a development experience level in our shop that we can we can dribble with our left hand and with our right hand in that, in that sense. At a high level, can you talk about the development process here? Like, did you tie up the ground for them or did they already have the ground and then you worked through some of the designs and the approval process? Yeah. So that's, I think that's maybe the differentiator from us for maybe a typical developer is when it is client driven, you find the site first for them, right? We're not out in the market trying to just find any corner and seeing who could fit there. It's we know where Circle K wants to be because we presented them 10 sites and this is the one they picked. And BJC was presented a dozen sites and this is the one they picked. So it's really driven by what does the client want? This is the location they want. Let's present them different options and then let's go put it under contract and go through the entitlement process. And Godfrey, Godfrey was fantastic. I mean, they were very receptive to the idea. The city council was fully on board and we got... We went through pretty smooth sailing from an entitlement process. So that's 
that's a rarity. You know, typically there's a lot of hoops to jump through when it comes to development. There's a lot of entitlements and a lot of aldermen you got to meet with and present to city council a number of times and get the mayor's blessing and you got to go through staff and all that stuff is well and good, but it, it is a nice breath of fresh air when you get a city that says, let's go. Right. So for a client led development, this is like something I, I don't really hear much about it. I'm, you know, more so thinking about or talking about uh, your typical development structure. You're tying up the ground for them after they choose the site. And then you're building the facility or the, the, the center. And then are you selling it to them or, or how does this yes. look? Yeah. So the way this, I mean, every, you can structure it in a million ways, right? But this one in particular, we placed the property under contract and we hired the civil engineer to design a layout that fit their needs. We hired the architect to design the building the way they needed it. And, and the client drove all those decisions, right? They, we hired them, but it really is whatever you guys want. What, what is your prototype? How does this fit? How does this work for you? And then we went out and got a construction loan and built it for them. And we had to have weekly meetings with their team to go over progress and make sure that they knew exactly what was happening and answer any questions that the contractor might have had. Say, or, you know, this wall needs to move six inches this way or six inches that way. You know, the, the person at BJC had to make some decisions in that with the architect. And so it was really how can we serve the client and what they need and our team did a fantastic job of, and they, and I think BJC felt really great about the end product. And then we owned it. I mean, we, we were, we owned the land, we owned the building and we leased it to them. So they had a, a 10 year lease uh, that they leased from us. Okay. Uh, now I understand. So yeah. that, that's really, to me, it sounds like the perfect scenario. And from the owner operator's perspective, if you have that tenant in your back pocket before you even uh, break ground. That's that sounds like a, a dream scenario. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it's in our back pocket. I mean, they they let us, right? I mean, they are. They, it's for them. They're the ones who want this structure, and all we were there to do was serve as the conduit to get them, because they're not in the development business. They are in the healthcare business, so they needed someone to solve that issue for them, and we were thrilled to do it for them. Yeah. So in your front pocket, even better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're not, I'm in their pocket really like the, yeah, yeah. it's their pockets and I'm the one who's, who's thank you. This is great. Yeah, thank you. They, they had Tom in their back pocket. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we talked earlier about um, some of the markets you guys look at. I know you guys are looking all over St. Louis in in the types of municipalities or neighborhoods that, that make sense with your model. Uh, what other cities are you looking at? Uh, you say Midwest or you've said Midwest, but that can mean any number of cities. So I think the, and I'm glad you asked that because I, it's expertise, especially in retail is very local. And the, our market knowledge decreases in, in scope is further out from St. Louis you get. That said, we have clients that have taken us to many of the major metros in St. Louis, including Drury, where I worked. You know, I'd spent a lot of time in Indianapolis, spent a lot of time in Kansas City. My partner, Chris, took Dutch Brothers coffee all through Kansas and all through Missouri. Jared has taken Texas Roadhouse all through Southern Illinois and Missouri. And so it's really, you draw a big ring around St. Louis, call it from Kansas City to Indianapolis. You go up to Des Moines and Omaha, and then you go to Nashville and Little Rock, like we have done deals in all of these markets and we, we know where the retailers want to be. So, and we have great relationships. We've got relationship with the, with brokers in all these markets. And so that's really where we can drive a lot of value. If you send me to Seattle, I'm not going to, A, I'm not going to know a single broker and B, I've never been to Seattle. I don't know any of the streets. So I can't pretend to have market knowledge, but I absolutely have market knowledge in Kansas city, Indianapolis, Nashville, Des Moines, Omaha, those places. So, it, and, and I mentioned those big cities cause I think there's, they're diverse economies, right? They're big enough where, you know, we, we talk about cities like Springfield, Illinois, that has a huge employer in State Farm. But Peoria had a huge employer uh, in, what was the, 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 uh, the... Was it Caterpillar? It's Caterpillar. You know, and Caterpillar left and went to Chicago. And that's really hurt the economy of Peoria. You know, for us to go and feel comfortable in Springfield, we have to know that State Farm's going to be there forever. And there's no way we can predict that. So we really like to gravitate towards the major metros where you have that diverse economy, that stability, that base of income where you can rely on the value of the dirt 
holding long term. You didn't mention Chicago, so is it safe to assume <laughs> yeah, a Chicago? On <laughs> okay, <laughs> why is that? Chicago is the the story goes. Cook County has a real issue with their real estate taxes. Cook County they can just jack up your real estate taxes whenever they want, and that risk is really hard to understand unless you are living Chicago real estate every day. And for us to get smart enough on Cook County real estate taxes is would take more time than we have. We know other markets better. We feel more comfortable in the laws of those markets. So Chicago is just a beast of its own that we're just not ready to, to tackle yet. I uh, totally understand that. And I think another piece that I think about whenever I even dream about thinking about Chicago <laughs> <laughs> is um, the mom and pops in the markets you mentioned. They may own one center, two centers, maybe three at the most. Mm -hmm. But in Chicago, a mom and pop might own 20 or 30 centers. Sure. And they may be operating like the professional outfits in some of these other cities. So I just think there's more opportunity in some of these cities that you mentioned as well. Sure. Why would you say you guys look at the Midwest compared to other maybe hotter parts of the country that have more population growth aside from market knowledge? Is there any other reason? Yeah, I think it's... It's a phenomenon that I think you and I have talked about before. It's really strange to me that you look at a Starbucks that's on the market right now and the cap rate that we discussed earlier. The cap rates for Midwest retail is higher for the exact same product than it is in the, the, the hot markets. You go to the East Coast, West Coast, Florida. I don't have up-to-date market knowledge right now, but a Starbucks would probably trade in the mid fives on a cap rate basis. But you can buy one in Kansas City for the mid sixes. It's the same credit. It's the same type of building construction. But for some reason, the market has decided that Florida is a better place to own a Starbucks than in Missouri. I don't know why. But to that end, to answer your question, there's more return on an investment in the Midwest relative to the, the coastal markets. It just is for the exact same product. Someone smarter than me maybe knows the answer. I just, it doesn't make sense to me. So I'd rather go where the returns are. I agree. I, I like the Midwest. And if you look at downturns, uh, the Midwest tends to fare a little better than some of the uh, uh, more volatile markets in the country. The highs aren't as high, but the lows are definitely not as low. Yeah, exactly. Well, how can people learn more about you, your company, if uh, there was something else that they were wondering about? Well, I think, I think this is interesting because... One of the things you and I could probably do a second podcast about would be social media and Twitter. And it's not an exaggeration to say that Twitter has changed my career for the better, that connecting with people like you, connecting with a retail broker, Scott Stinson, right? To connect with Carter Martini, other, another guy on re retail in St. Louis. There's just so many relationships that you can build through social media. And we're trying to do a much better job of Twitter posts, of LinkedIn posts, of sharing on Instagram, because it, it it's a way for people to get to know us without having to come in and sit in our office for an hour, right? You get to see how we think and, and we get to see how Raj thinks by the, the tweets you post. And I think it's just such a interesting time we're in, in that the more you share about your knowledge on podcasts, in tweets, in email newsletters, the more you can kind of gain credibility with an audience that people understand you, understand what you're about, understand how you're looking at the world, how you're solving problems, and they can decide for themselves, oh, this is someone I want to follow. This is someone I want to keep track of. And if they ever have an investment vehicle that I, I want to be a part of it. And so, you know, us at Scout, we're trying to be very technology forward. It's, it's, it's hard, especially when you've got guys that are not used to posting on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm trying to teach my guys about it and I'm trying to learn more as well. But it's certainly a cool opportunity to grow your brand in this social media age that we're in. And I think this podcast is like the perfect example of, of the importance of it. I agree. Uh, so if someone wants to learn about you, the way you think, they can search you up on LinkedIn or Twitter and Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And I'll link it as well. Yeah. We got, you know, we got LinkedIn, Twitter, we got a website. Um, yeah, all the all the, the usual stuff for sure. And the website is scoutinvests.com. 
uh, invests is plural. It's hard to say. Yeah, we'll, we'll link that as well. So no worries. <laughs> I, I think so that we end the show with what we call a hole in one. Yeah. So that's your biggest piece of advice for someone's either their personal life or business or both that they can implement today. I think you already gave a part of your hole in one or one hole in one, which is put yourself out there, whether it's, you know, your uh, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, let people see how you think or who you are. Do you have another piece of advice outside of what you just discussed? This scout capital phase of my life, which is going to be the last job I ever have if, if I get my way, happened because I took what I had learned and I decided to go for it. You know, one of the most inspiring quotes I've ever seen was in the front yard in my neighborhood. There was a sign just said, it's never too late. And, you know, sometimes I would get in a rut of like, oh man, I'm 40 years old and I'm working for someone else. And, you know, I have all these dreams to be an entrepreneur. And, and that sign is just like, it's never too late to go for it. It's never too late to, whether it's business or in relationships, it's never too late to call that person that you're mad at and say you're sorry, right? Or it's never too late to reach out to your grandparents that you haven't seen in a couple of years. You know, it's never too late to try that business idea. And to me, like, I, I just found that so inspiring. I, I saw that every day in COVID. I was like walking my dog and I'd be like, it's never too late. It's never too late. And to me, I think that's just such a great mantra for so many applications in life that, you know, it's never too late. If, if you're listening to this and you're 60 years old and you never started a business, you always wanted to, it's not too late. It's not too late to go for it, to start an LLC. Call me. I know how to do it. It's so easy. You know, it's never too late to take care of your health or to reach out to loved ones. Like I, that's my inspirational quote for the day. You know, if, if, if you got a, a dream you want to chase, man, it's just, it's never too late to go for it. That's so powerful. It's sometimes it's the simple things that uh, you kind of, you know, take for granted. Like it's never too late. It's a quote we've all heard, but until you hear someone like yourself expand on it or, or just talk about how it touched you, I feel like. It's one of those that a lot of us would gloss over. So I, I plan on making a few phone calls after this. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, thanks for your time. Gosh. Really appreciate it. This is awesome. Uh, I think it was a great conversation and yeah. uh, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I did. Thanks, man. All right. Thanks. All right. If you're a high quality company interested in reaching the high performing audience of Country Club Conversations, Let's see how we can work together. To explore sponsorship opportunities, email advertising at storyboardliving.com. That's advertising at storyboardliving.com.